Mm. That's a really good song right there. Happy Easter. Easter. You guys did better than the first service. I'll say that. Good job. Good job. I still think you left something on the table, but, you know, well, it's okay. Hey, uh, if you have your Bible, grab it and open it up to Luke chapter 24. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, uh, there should be one somewhere nearby on a seat in front of you, and you can turn to page 859, and you will find Luke chapter 24 there, okay? Um, On Christmas Day 2007, I was a sophomore in college, and I had just gotten engaged to this beautiful, amazing, smart, athletic young woman named Mallory, and she is all of those things still today. Amen? Praise God. Uh, and, uh, and it was our first Christmas together. We spent Christmas at her parents' house, uh, and I had not experienced a Christmas like this in a long time. There were gifts everywhere. I mean, everywhere. Uh, I didn't grow up with these extravagant Christmas experiences. Maybe you guys know what I'm talking about, but I didn't grow up that way, and I show up to this house, and I see gifts everywhere, and I got really excited. Because there's one thing, if you don't know it, I'm going to tell you, I love a gift, all right? That's like my thing, is I love a gift. There's nothing that tells me I love you more than a thoughtful gift. So I, I, I am all for gifts. And on that particular uh, year, the gift that I was most wanting was an iPod. Uh, not one of these fancy, like, touchscreen things, okay? But literally like a brick with a circle that you, like, scroll through to find your song. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I wanted one of those iPods. And, uh, and so I was, I was really, really excited, hoping that I was going to get it. We celebrated Christmas with my parents before going down to Florida to be with Mallory's family. And mom and dad did not get me an iPod. And so there was no iPod to be found on the tree uh, in North Carolina. And it was, it was upsetting and devastating. Um, and uh, I was like, oh no. Uh, so then I was just like hoping maybe I'll get enough money to buy one myself, you know? And so I was getting close to that. And, uh, and we got to Christmas day and we opened up all of the presents and it was a great day. I mean, the presents were amazing. I, I felt so loved and so blessed, but no iPod. And I was like, man, no iPod. That's really what I want. I wanted that more than anything. All right, well. So we're like cleaning up the present trash. You know you how you do? You like you get, you know, all the stuff and you put it in a trash bag. And we're doing all of that. And, and Mallory's dad's in the kitchen getting lunch ready and all the stuff. And, and, and then I hear Mallory's brother say, wait, what's this? And he goes over to the Christmas tree. And on the branches, he pulls off an envelope. He goes, it's weird, Derek. It's got your name on it. And I was like, oh, that is weird because I'm not a part of this family. Uh, and and so, so anyway, so I, I took the envelope and I opened it thinking like, oh, this is the money. This is the rest of the money to buy my iPod. And it's, it's just a riddle. It's like a, it was, it was, it was a riddle. That, and I, I don't, I'm really slow, okay? I don't know if you guys know. I was 19 years old, I was super slow then, okay? Um, And so I didn't get it, I didn't understand. Like I I like read the riddle, I had no idea where it was sending me or what what it was saying. So everyone in the house had to help me figure it out. Sent me to this bookshelf where I found another envelope and I opened it and there was another clue and another riddle. And that sent me to another one and to another one and to another one. Finally, after about five of these things, I opened up an envelope and it took me to the front door. And as I opened the front door on the front porch, right on the welcome mat was an iPod (laughs) with a red bow and a note from my awesome and amazing new fiance. She had saved up all of her money as a poor college student working work study to buy me this present for Christmas. Uh, No help from her parents, no help from my parents, just herself decided to get that for me because she knew I really, really wanted it. And I had given up all hope that this iPod was going to show up that Christmas, but then there it was, right on my doorstep. And maybe you have had a story like that um, in your life. Maybe you have have just had this immense hope for something and then kind of given up hope because it never really arrived. And then, uh, then all of a sudden there it was, just right there on your doorstep. And uh, that story is a lot like the one we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 24. So if you have your Bible, 
uh, turn to verse 13 in Luke 24 as we begin this story together. It says, Now that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along them, and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, you have these two disciples, and they're walking on this road to this little small village outside of Jerusalem called Emmaus. It's likely where they lived and where they made their home. It says here that it was seven miles, so that would have taken about an hour to an hour and a half. And at some point during that hour, an hour and a half, uh, uh, they, they're, they're discussing all that had taken place. This is Easter Sunday. So on Easter Sunday, they're walking along the road talking about all that had happened, all that had happened that week because they were trying to make sense of it because everything they thought was gonna happen didn't happen. When Jesus rode into the city the week before thinking he was gonna be this great king and then, he, and then he's crucified before the end of the week. And so they're trying to make sense of all this. How did this happen? What's going on? It wasn't what they expected. And then it tells us that Jesus just walks up next to him, but that they were kept from recognizing him. The Greek word here is the word ekratuno, which means prevented or held from recognizing him. It's unclear if this is because Jesus' appearance has changed post-resurrection or if this is just some sort of way of indicating spiritual blindness. I like to think of it in that terminology or that thought process because oftentimes when you read things in the scriptures, it's more of a figure of speech to give you a glimpse into a bigger, uh, deeper spiritual reality more than a literal reality. And it made me wonder, it made me think, have there ever been times where I failed to realize the presence of Jesus is near me? Have you ever failed to realize the moment when Jesus has drawn near to you? Maybe there has, has been something that has kept your eyes from recognizing him walking up alongside of you. A lot of times this will happen in seasons of mourning or in suffering. We've experienced deep loss or deep pain. And Jesus loves to show up in those moments. But a lot of times those circumstances keep our focus on those circumstances. And we fail to see that Jesus has come near to us in the midst of that. And so we just have to ask ourselves, is that us? Has Jesus come alongside of us and we just missed it? The story continues... And says, Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, like stopped in their tracks by this, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know what has happened in these days? And Jesus says, what things? I love this. It's so funny to me, just the Jesus' sense of humor. If you read through the Gospels, I promise you will laugh out loud more than once, okay? Uh, so so g give it a shot. I promise you will think um, a lot of it is, is funny. Um, but he, he, he looks at this guy, and he makes a joke, basically, and Cleopas is not in the mood for joking. <laughs> he's like, he's downcast. He's, he's in this space of where he's like, dude, can you, like, are you serious right now? Are you the only one who doesn't know what happened? Are you the only one who has no idea about the guy who rode in last week and we thought was gonna be a king and then they put him on a cross on Friday? Are you the only one? It seems like everything that happened to Jerusalem that weekend centered around Jesus' death. It was the central event then and it's a central event for us now. And it's, it's really important because maybe you came in here today and you actually, you didn't know. And that's okay. Maybe you haven't heard about this story. And that's okay. I want you to know that you're in the right place. And hopefully before you leave here, you'll know what this cross and this empty grave are all about. But if you're going to know what it's all about, this next section of the story is really important, so you gotta hone in, okay? So let's pay attention to this one. It says, about <coughs> Jesus of Nazareth, Cleopas answered, it's about Jesus. 
He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's been three days since this all took place. In the ancient world, if you were dead for three days, you were dead. <laughs> as, long as, as long as nothing had happened up until like that third day, that third day was like the final pronouncement of your death. And so that's basically what he's saying. He's saying, but it's three days and Jesus is still dead. In addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but they did not find his body. They came, told us that they had seen visions of angels who said that he was alive, but then some of our companions, they went to the tomb and they found it just as the women said, but they did not see Jesus. Now, Cleopas is sad, right? He's like, you can kind of tell by the way he's talking about Jesus in this story. He's talking about Jesus in the past tense. He's saying Jesus was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed. He was killed. We had hoped that he would have been more. We would have hoped that he would have been the Messiah. We would have hoped that he was the one. But he's been gone three days now. And although the women say that the angels appeared to them and all the stuff, like some of us went and investigated and couldn't find him. So that's why we're headed home. That's why we've left Jerusalem. That's why we're headed back. It's because he's gone and all of our hopes, all of our dreams of what Jesus would have been and could have been are no more. And maybe some of you in the room today, you feel like this. Maybe Jesus is just dead to you. Maybe you just hoped that going to church would change things. Maybe you hoped doing things and living your life in a certain way would change things, but it hasn't. Maybe something bad happened and you're like, well, if Jesus was alive, if Jesus was really good, if Jesus was God, then how could he let such awful things take place? Maybe you want to believe. Maybe you want to believe more than anything. But the evidence just seems to point in the opposite direction. And so your hope is lost. And if that's you this morning, uh, instead of me trying to encourage you, I want to share a story with you that I hope will encourage you. Someone here in our church who I think uh, felt hopeless at times and yet saw God just work in amazing ways in their life. And so just, uh, if you will, turn your attention to the screens. My mother and my grandmother kept me in church from infant on up. Um, they showed me who God was, and how he gives you strength to get through what's going on in your life. My 20s hit and uh, I kind of stopped going to church for a little while. Um, but I came back to Christ to feel like the prodigal daughter. I. Uh, I ran from from God, even though I knew that He's what I need, who I need. He's everything I need. But He caught up with me, <laughs> and uh, here I am. And I'm so happy that I was brought up in church, um, because I knew I knew what I was doing was wrong, and I knew how to come back. I was born with tricuspid atresia, which means that I only had three chambers of a heart instead of four. My left ventricle bottom ch chamber was not there. Um, so from day one, I was sick and had to have like small operations. Like I had a shunt put in my heart. So it would, um, it would work until I was old enough to do open heart surgery. And then at five years old, I had my first open heart surgery. Um, I did, that, that did pretty well, um, but I got sick again in my teens. I went to Chicago to have a second open heart surgery. 
in 2001. So they, whatever they did, um, they, um, they fixed me until last year or two years ago, 2022. And then I started failing again. I was in diastolic heart failure and liver failure. Um, so I was coming to church and with my oxygen tank in hand <laughs> and going, you know, everywhere. And all of a sudden I start hearing words like this, um, failure, um, transplant, the heart and liver transplant. And I'm like, what? What? Okay. Okay. So I was in the hospital and I was dying. I knew I was. I knew I was going to die unless I got these organs. And I was in a way okay with that because I was going to be with my father. I was going to be with my savior. Um, but he didn't think that way. <laughs> and I love how God shows up because been in the hospital like two weeks they're trying to help me breathe and I'm on 15 liters of oxygen and I see you and I, I don't remember a lot of this you know because my O2 stat was so low but I remember laying in that hospital bed and even the nurses were crying I mean it was just I was dying like I said um and all of a sudden, May 23rd, doctor comes in, we have a viable heart and liver. Again, what? <laughs> I mean, like three weeks on the list. People wait years on this list. Um, God was like, no, 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 no. I'll give this to you in three weeks. <laughs> so May 23rd, I had the surgery. I got a new heart and a new liver. I stayed in the hospital until July 5th, so that's about six weeks. And I healed, and praise God, here I am today. Man, I just want to tell my story. I just want to let everyone know how good God is. Because if He could do this for me, He'll do it for you. He loves you just as much as He loves me. I'm sorry. <laughs> God is just so good. That's all I know. I mean, He saved me for whatever reason. I had a double transplant. I have a new heart and a new liver. I'm made new, literally, figuratively, and every other way possible. God is so good. Um, whatever he wants me to do, I will do. Either I'm going to be with Jesus, or I'm going to stay on this earth for however much longer. Either way, I have no say in it, so I'm just going to praise your name. I'm just going to sing and praise, praise God. But I'm here, I'm not going anywhere. Lake Springs is my home. And my family, I have an incredible family here at the Lake Springs Church. And I love my family. If you have lost hope, I want to encourage you to just keep trusting in the goodness of God because he is good and he loves you and like Jamie said if he can do it for her he can do it for you he loves you just as much as he loves her this story continues and Jesus said to them he said how foolish are you how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I love how Jesus deals with these disciples. He doesn't call them stupid. He doesn't call them dumb. He just calls them foolish. Foolish. The idea of foolishness being that if you don't know my word, it says in the Old Testament, you are a fool. 
And so the idea is, is that it seems as if they have been misled to believe that the, the, the Hebrew Bible was pointing in a different direction about the Messiah than they really believed. They thought that the Messiah of Israel, the deliverer of Israel, was going to deliver the people from suffering, and they completely missed that the redemption and deliverance actually comes through suffering. And so they were just foolish because they had missed the real truths of the Bible. To be honest, I think we do this a lot. We often read the Bible at a disadvantage. We read the Bible being brought up to believe certain storylines, certain themes, certain belief systems that are passed down throughout generations, and yet they don't align with the truths of Scripture. We think we know what the Bible is really all about, and, and we are prevented because we, we believe this and because we're looking at it from the wrong angle. Many of us look at the Bible as 21st century American Christians and don't ever put ourselves in the context of someone who lived in Israel 6,000 years ago. That's a mistake. And it leads us to read the story with the wrong lens and from the wrong perspective. One of the things that I often run into is... Uh, is talking to people, when I'm talking to people about Jesus or when I'm talking to people about the resurrection, when I'm talking to people about Jesus' sacrifice, they believe that Jesus died so that we can go to heaven. And Jesus didn't just die so we could go to heaven. Jesus died so that we could actually bring heaven here on earth. He died so that he could restore a broken relationship between him and humanity and restore what was lost and what was broken at the fall, which was that we are called to be co-rulers and co-heirs um, uh, in this, this world. And we are called to have dominion over it. And we are called to bring his way of life here on earth as it is in heaven. That's why Jesus says, when you pray, you should pray this way. That my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The way that happens is through us living in our truest identity as his image bearers. Not walking around with a limp because of our sin. He saved us from our sin. And he made us image bearers again so that we can bring his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. We are meant to represent him in every way. That is our, that is our job as human beings, to be his representatives and to bring his kingdom here, to be his ambassadors for his kingdom. And so I just, my hope is, is that we do not let all of the things that have been passed down to us by other people get in the way of what the Bible actually says and the truth that is actually there. Look at how this story ends. It says, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he sat at the table with them, he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and began to give it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us as we walked and as we talked with him on the road and opened the scriptures to us? I think there's a lot of significance in this part of the story. First, I think that it's really significant uh, that Jesus just comes along and he walks and talks with um, us like one who talks to a friend. And that when Jesus and, and us engage in a conversation, it gives us a desire for more of those conversations. One of the most fascinating things about the Christian faith is that the resurrection actually makes this possible. That it's because of the resurrection that we can now live a walking and talking, breaking bread with, living in the presence of Jesus all the days of our life, life. 
We get to encounter a kind of walk with God that begins to reveal who he really is. And it often takes place as we open the scriptures and we see who he is in the Bible and as we spend time praying, talking and listening to him, having a conversation. That's what prayer is. It isn't just a one-sided like, hey God, thanks for this and thanks for that and can you do this for me? And No, it's, it's, it's actually do like talk to him but stop and listen too because he'll probably say something if you'll listen. It's a conversation. And these are the things he's doing with these disciples. He's just having a conversation. He's opening up the scriptures and he begins to reveal himself and their hearts are burning within them as he does it. And a lot of times... This flame gets sparked at church when you attend church. I talk to a lot of people, uh, honestly, who are miserable most of the time. I sit down with them over dinner, or I sit down with them over lunch or coffee or something like that, and they just tell me their story, and they tell me about how hurt and how broken they are and, and, and how miserable they feel. They struggle with anxiety and depression. They deal with health issues. They have a lot of baggage that they're carrying around from their past. They're addicted to drugs, alcohol, pornography, you name it. And often due to their struggles, they feel desperately far from God. And they feel like they are constantly pushing him away. And honestly, many of them feel like he has no desire at all to be near to them because of the life that they live. But often what they'll tell me is if they do go to church, they say, well, when I come to church, I feel a little bit better. When I come to church, it makes me a little happier. I leave happier than I came in. When I come to church, it's, it's the only time I feel good all week long. And yet many of them still rarely darken the doors of the church because they still feel far from God. And they still feel like he has and wants nothing to do with them. But if you're, if you're here today, I want you to just look at me for a second, okay? If you're looking down or if you're distracted on something else, just look up for just a second and pay attention to this for just a second because I think this is really key. The resurrection of Jesus opens a door and tears down the walls that we have established that would separate us from God. Those walls, we built them, and he tore them down. We put them up. He tore them down through his resurrection, and he gives us now full access to himself. We have full access to walk with the God of the universe every moment of every day in our life. He also gives us opportunities to be united to our Christian brothers and sisters because of his resurrection. For us to say no to that, we're foolish. For us to give our lives to lesser things is foolish. What else do you want? What is better than being able to walk with God every day of your life? We have access to this amazing opportunity at this amazing relationship with God and our brothers and sisters. And you may think that God's far off, but he's not. He's not as far as you think. He's not that far away because he died so that he could draw near to you and that you could draw near to him. And so we can live this life and we can walk and talk with him on the road of life as we walk along with our companions from the church. That's the hope that we have. And that is how we can bring the kingdom of God here as it is in heaven, as if we give ourselves to that. And as good as being in church is on any particular Sunday, I'm telling you that sitting and having an abiding relationship with God every day in the normal walks of life is so much better. Church is only gonna get you so far. It might be the spark that begins, but the walk 
And with Jesus is where the heart begins to burn with passion. And you begin to have a fire inside of you. And you may have not felt that fire in a long time. You may have never felt that fire at all in your life. But then I would ask you, when was the last time you went on a walk with Jesus? When was the last time that you got around some Christian community and went on a walk with them? There's something powerful when we get together and we begin to try and walk with Jesus. He ignites something in our life that otherwise would just burn out. And he keeps it burning so that we want more and more and more. The more and more we spend time with him, the more and more we want to spend time with him. The more and more we walk with him, the more and more we wake up looking to go for a walk in the cool of the morning. And we rest with him at the end of each day. Because what he offers us is actually an intimate connection and an intimate relationship through his death and resurrection. I picture it this way. You know, Mallory and I, we often run like Usain Bolt in the Olympics uh, most days. You guys know what I mean? That was a joke. All right. Uh, you guys, whew, tough crowd. Oh, my goodness. You guys do know who Usain Bolt is, right? Um, real tall Jamaican guy. Uh, runs real fast. Anyway, um, that's like my life most of the time, running real fast, kids, job, all the stuff. You guys get it, right? You guys do it too. Um, so we're not alone. But most nights after we put our kids to the bed, we both kind of meander our way to the bedroom slowly and with a little bit of a limp, okay, uh, to be quite honest, because we got four little ones and, and it's tough. And we climb into bed and we chat and we read and we pray and sometimes we watch TV and sometimes we just lay there. We just hold each other. Sometimes we even make love, even though we're exhausted. Sometimes I want to make love, but she's too exhausted. <laughs> Can I get an amen, men? I know you know what I'm talking about, all right? I know you get it, all right? Uh, so, but here's the thing. No matter, no matter what, no matter what we do in those moments, they are precious moments that we have together. And at some point throughout that time period, we simply just begin to enjoy being there with one another. And we are able to just rest together. And sometimes we just drift off in this peaceful sleep laying next to one another. And I know you might think, wow, that's a really weird way to think about my relationship with God. <laughs> but I'm telling you, truly, the more time you spend with him, the more those moments come out. The more powerfully and intimate your relationship really becomes. And the more you desire to just be with him. The more at peace you find yourself as you spend that time with him. And you are able just to rest with him like one that you really love in this world. And it would seem as if Cleopas and these other disciples, they have a close relationship with Jesus. They've, they've been around Jesus. They've been around the other disciples after this. They go back to Jerusalem after their eyes are open, who Jesus is. They go back to Jerusalem and they, they spend time with the 12 and they're telling their story and all this other kind of stuff. So they were, they were close. And yet they didn't see it at first. But as they felt like that burning in their heart, and they experience Jesus at the table, their eyes open to this deep reality of who was with them this whole time and how much they love him and how much they want him to stay, right? And maybe something in you is igniting today. Maybe today you showed up to church for the first time in a long time and you feel something like igniting inside of you. You feel this, this burning passion inside your heart and inside your soul that's starting to come alive. And what I would say is, man, if that's you, then why don't you just make this your prayer? Why don't you just say, hey, Jesus, why don't you, can, can you stay? I wanna hear more of what you have to say. Jesus, can, can we just spend more time together? Jesus, don't leave me. 
Jesus, can you come to the table, break bread with me? Jesus, I want you to be a part of my life, not just once a week or every so often. I want you to be a part of my life. I want to be with you and you with me every day for the rest of my life. You have access to that kind of relationship because of the resurrection of Jesus. And so if that passion's burning, just invite him to stay. And you keep showing up. I promise you, if that is actually your prayer, he will answer it. If you really desire to be with him more, he will be with you as much as you want to be with him. He loves you that much. But here's the final thing that I'll say as I wrap up this story. You know, Jesus, when he, was, uh, when he conquered sin and death and came out of the grave, he instituted this new creation. Uh, Paul says in the New Testament, he says that those who are in Christ have been baptized into his death and they have been uh, and, 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 and raised in, uh, like he was raised from the dead in his resurrection. They've put on Christ and we've put on Christ. When we've done that, the old self is gone. Like who we used to be is no more, but the new has come and we are new creations in Christ. And so when we've done that, we put our faith in Jesus in that way, we are made new. And this is a, a new creation that Jesus is enacting. And I find it interesting that the first meal that happens in Genesis chapter three in the creation story is when a woman takes a piece of fruit and eats it and hands it to her, her mate, uh, Adam, and he eats it and their eyes are opened and their eyes are open to sin, evil, the desire to hide, the reality of feeling far from God and separated from him. And I think it's an incredible, incredible sign of God's goodness and Jesus' love that in the first meal of the new creation, as he breaks bread with these disciples around the table, their eyes open to the fact that sin and death are no more. And he has overcome the grave and he has overcome the wages of sin through his suffering. Both are eye-opening meals. But the, the, the eye-opening part of the new creation is that that separation that we had from God is no more. He just comes and sits at the table with us and breaks bread with us. This meal has the ability to open up our eyes to the promises of God and he can restore the hope that's been lost along the way. So when we come to the table this Easter and we remember his body broken, his blood shed, I pray that our hearts are burning within us, that our hope is restored, that this meal reminds us that he's paid it all for our sin. And it reminds us that he did this through suffering, not from suffering. Maybe some of you come in and you ask, well, how, how could Jesus be real? How could Jesus be good if my life is so hard? If things in my life are so difficult, don't miss the scriptures. He doesn't save us from suffering. He saves us through suffering. You may want Jesus to be something that he's never gonna be. Fix your eyes on the real Jesus who said no matter what it is that you go through, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart for I've overcome the world. So whatever hurts you here, it won't hurt you in my kingdom. It will be done away with. Let this meal remind us that he drew near to us and is still here right now in this place, in his people, right next to you, ready to go on a walk whenever you say, hey, let's go. Let this meal open your eyes to the fact that he truly loves you, truly loves you, that he wants to have a relationship with you, 
that he desires that you would represent him to the world. (laughs) That he wants to restore your identity and make you more like Jesus. Let this meal open your eyes and restore your hope that if you will actually give yourself to being with him, he can... He can change you and transform you to a place where you become like him and where then you can do the things that he did. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today and we thank you for just the chance we have to be here and celebrate your resurrection. God, I just pray that we will accept the invitation to go on a walk with you and talk with you as one who talks to a friend, that we can come with our, our, our hurts and our pains. We can share the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you aren't going to despise us. You aren't going to reject us, but you'll just draw closer, and we'll want to be with you more. God, give us a hope to give ourselves to this give ourselves to the process of entering in to this intimate relationship with you where we go and we we start our day with you and we end our day with you god thank you for dying on the cross for our sin praise be yours for the grave could not hold you down As we come to the table this morning, may we we just sit and reflect and take hope in that together. As your sons and as your daughters. And we pray this in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen.